Mach nur Gewitter. Ja, jetzt kommt noch Wort bei dir, Mann. Okay. Hauskippen. Das ist ein Feuer nur mehr. Das ist ein Feuer nur so wie wir gehen mit. Toilets that just at the front door as well. Um, I'll introduce the panel in a minute, but what we'll say is there's leaflets about the three books on the back table, some sub stickers if anybody wants one, and we're also having a collection if anybody wants to contribute because these things can become on their own. So, look who you have to, but if you can, please do. Okay, so on our panel today we've got Craig Dale, who is coming real. <laughs> just told me this, Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. Hey, yeah, hey, no. Pat Lee, who is here in, in a union capacity to talk about workers' rights, so it's Unison that he's involved in. And Graham Bell. <laughs> Graham was um, a, is coordinator for Inverness, Highlands and Islands, uh, Salvo. And we jointly hosted the Inverness meeting on Freeport, so he's going to talk a wee bit about what came out of that. And that's all I'm going to say. Craig's going to start, so I'll just hand it over to him. Thank you. Hi, folks. So just checking if I speak, speak like that, this volume, everyone at the back can hear me? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it needs to be close. So yeah, thanks for having me here today. I'm invited here to, to talk about the, 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 the Freeport plans for Scotland, um, what they mean sort of in general, um, why we're getting them, and what our two governments, UK and Scottish government, is doing to support them. Um, proponents of the Freeports say that this is a post-Brexit uh, unleashing of Britain's prosperity. Hmm. It'll create, create new jobs, create new wealth, grow the economy, it's all, all around wonderful thing. Opponents see them as opportunities for tax dodging, smuggling and assault on workers' rights. So we're going to explore both sides of that. You can probably guess which side I'm on. <laughs> so, how many of you here have heard about, a, you know, have an idea of what a free port is? In, you know, you might have an idea of you know, the traditional Freeport, which is like a warehouse or some sort of factory or industrial estate behind a fence, but near a port, near a harbour, but uh, at the, the air, but beyond the security points of an airport, that kind of thing. The purpose of a Freeport is that you can import components, say car parts, engine parts, and build them into a finished good with added value, the finished car and then export it again without having to pay import and export duties. The idea being if you had to say, for example, pay 20% import duties on the car components, turn them into a car, then pay another 10% to export, then that pushes up the, the, the price of the final car. However, you don't want these cheap uh, goods maybe leaking into your domestic economy and undercutting your domestic car um, manufacturing. So the idea is, you have this little zone where all this cheap import and export can happen, but if those cars come into your domestic economy, then you have to pay the full taxes. So you've insulated your economy from, from the, the import and the export. <coughs> However, what we see in the modern world is that actually these import import and export taxes are not a big factor in price anymore. A lot of these imports, import taxes have come down, a lot of markets have harmonised, especially within the EU, where you have the single market, and this was essentially why, even while the UK was an EU, EU member, when it did used to have free ports, they were kind of a bit useless, because we were just, with, we just traded normally with the single market anyway. What I'll say is what a free port is not, because there are some stories flying about, about these. You might have heard the story about the charter cities. This is not what these people are. The charter cities actually, actually comes from the, the alt-right internet forums. It's a, it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. It comes from pretty much the same groups as, as the ones that tell you that the 15 minute city is, a, is some sort of penal colony. Um, the idea of a charter city is where you actually give a company 
full sovereignty and extraterritoriality over a chunk of territory where they can make their own laws. That's somewhat different from a company lobbying very hard on the government to get regulatory and tax benefits and usually getting them because the government capitulates to them. Not the same. Um, they're also not post-Brexit unburdening of regulations. As I said, free ports were illegal in the EU, and the UK had some, they just became a bit pointless. Now in Scotland, five sites were considered for the, for the UK's free port scheme, with one in Clyde, Forth, Aberdeen, Cromarty, and Orkney. Of those, two were selected, Orkney and here in Forth. It's quite interesting that both the Clyde and the Aberdeen groups disputed the final decision. The Clyde group, um, covering Glasgow and um, out to the west coast and parts of South Lanarkshire, they disputed the decision on the grounds that having two, two ports on the east coast was less beneficial than one ha having one on the west coast and one on the east coast. Um, they probably had a point in that, although I would dis still dispute the idea of doing this behind three ports. If anyone wants to ask me about the Ocean Span project, please do so in the Q&A and I'll tell you about a really interesting idea from about 50 years ago that might have been a, a, a better way to go about that. Aberdeen was also unhappy because, well, it's Aberdeen, they have oil money. <laughs> Plastic oil money wants is taxes. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's happened to the, the, the dispute side of that decision, um, but it doesn't look as if the, the decision is going to change in any way. Since then, both Glasgow and Aberdeen have been given the, the, the silver medals of special investment zones, which are kind of like free ports without the ports. Now, why is, where is the UK different from the traditional Freeport model? Is that these are very decentralised areas. This isn't just a warehouse sitting at the airside behind an airport or, or down, by, down by the harbour. These are massive. Okay, sorry about that. Um, these are massive bubbles, about 45 kilometres across. The one in fourth covers a population of around 1 million people. It extends pretty much to the coast, um, uh, Queensbury and, and Leith, all the way out to Grangemouth. In fact, the Cromarty one's an even better example, which I could show you a map. Uh, uh, we couldn't get the projector on the slides. If you search my name on YouTube, search Freeports of a, a, a YouTube version of this talk where you can see all my slides and, uh, and the maps on it. Um, because there's a little addition to the, to the regulations around these free ports that says you, if the bubble that you've drawn around the centre point of your, free, of your free port hits the sea, you can subtract off that area and add it on as an extra chunk of land. So the Cromarty bubble isn't a spherical bubble that hugs the coast. The northern edge of the bubble is about an hour's drive away from the centre. Um, here, as I say, we have that, that, uh, that bubble going from, from Leith and Queensbury to Grangemouth, about a million people living within it. There's five registered custom sites at the moment. Uh, Grangemouth, Rosyth, um, Burnt Island, Edinburgh Airport and Leith. So the text in my screen is very small. Um, and three of them are also registered tax sites. So these are the places where we now have tax and custom orders. There may be more coming. Any company within this bubble can potentially register for Freeport status. This will be an ongoing thing. We don't yet know what the limit of that will be. So how does it work? Does it mean that anyone within the fourth bubble who's paying tax is not paying tax anymore? Unfortunately not. The tax breaks only apply to companies within the Freeport and only certain taxes. I'm sure we'll get some more details from this uh, from the other speakers. Um, the Freeport sites can be located anywhere within that bubble. It's a very distributed system, which means if you're moving goods between customs sites, then you've got to treat those goods as if they're travelling between customs zones. It's almost like all that trouble, uh, the, the, the wrong word, all, all those complications around the Northern Irish border. We don't even get the benefits of being in a single market for doing it. So what tax breaks will you get? None. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> All of the proposed tax breaks are aimed at companies, not workers. So the UK controlled taxes are things like corporation tax, 
uh, or breaks um, or, or discounts on employers, not employees, national insurance. The Scottish Government devolved taxes that will be involved in these freeports include land and buildings transaction tax, the old stamp duty, and, and local authority business rates, non domestic rates. So, what will workers get? As we say, we're not getting tax benefits, are we getting extra workers' rights? Well, we heard um, that the Scottish Government had, had negotiated extra perks as part of this. This is why we were uh, happy to have them uh, over and above the, the free porch that England was getting. But the concessions that the Scottish Government won were marginal. Companies applying for free porch status within these bubbles, I'll quote, may include elements that align with the Scottish Government's fair work first criteria for example, commitments on the real living wage and trade union engagement. May. So you might get paid minimum wage. <laughs> and what will the economy get? Almost nothing. I seriously could su uh, suggest going on to YouTube and searching out Richard Murphy. He's got a really good series on free ports, particularly a video called Why, Why Free Ports Are a Terrible Idea, in which he outlines that they do not create economic growth. At best, they move the growth around. They move growth from outside the Freeport into the Freeport. Um, and almost everywhere that Freeports have been used, they have been associated with crime, with smuggling, or just with hiding wealth. The other traditional idea of a Freeport is a warehouse that suddenly becomes very full of very valuable art. And especially with this model of Freeport, where you do have goods travelling overland between tax and customs sites, the risk of leakage into the domestic economy becomes very high. One of the other sort of benefits that's been touted, including by the Scottish Government, who were just over in Denmark a few weeks ago um, trying to negotiate Danish, Danish energy companies coming over to stop and build things in our free ports, is that they will benefit our renewable transition, specifically citing things like the Scotland project. I've been very critical of the Scotland to check out my work on, on, on that, but in this area, think about it for a second. The purpose of a free port is that you bring components into the country, build them into a thing, and then export it again. And if you keep the thing in your domestic economy, you have to pay the tax. That's the way it works. So if you're bringing wind turbine components into Scotland, turning them into wind turbines, and then building them into a Scottish wind uh, farm, how does the Freeport benefit this? There's only two ways I can see it working. One, you have a me massive mega factory producing thousands of wind turbines, many of which are for export, and you're exporting them cheaply using the tax breaks, and you use the economy of scale of that to, 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 to cross-subsidise your domestic wind turbines. But we're not talking about turbine factories on any, anything like that scale. The only other way I can see those free, those, um, uh, free ports benefiting, benefiting uh, Scotland is if they're paying their tax, they're not getting the tax benefit from the free port, but they are getting the benefit from reduced workers' rates and reduced Just workers' wages. So the only way I can see the free ports helping Scotland is if they're overall hurting Scotland. Can you hear me with this one, then? So why is the Scottish Government supporting these? Well, there's a few, few possible options. One is that I think there's a genuine fear of capital flight. I think there's a genuine fear that if, if Scotland didn't agree to the UK Freeport plan, then the UK would build a massive Freeport in Newcastle or Carlisle and start competing with the Scottish economy. Um, However, I also believe there's a genuine element of true believer within the Scottish Government. I think they honestly believe that the market will, uh, will provide and they will get the growth and the jobs that, they, that these, these things are, are touted for. And the current Scottish Government is all in on the concept of foreign direct investment, inwards investment as a, as a driver of economic growth. Commonwealth soon going to be publishing a paper showing just how much profit extraction has happened from Scotland as a result of that inwards investment. So keep an eye out on that when it comes out. And it's not a case 
that the Scottish Government is just passively allowing the UK to, to, to do these things on our soil and we can't resist it because, as I say, they're supporting them with devolved tax cuts. There was a consultation last month on the LBTT tax cut run by the Scottish Government. It was honestly one of the worst consultations I've ever engaged with. It did not ask the question, do you think these tax cuts are okay? Do you approve of these tax cuts? What it did was it gave you a line of legislation. You know, um, we, will, we will offer these tax cuts in, in sort of legalese language. And then asked the question, do you think this legislation will give effect to the proposed tax cut? <laughs> I am not the Scottish Government's legal clerk. I am not checking their spelling problem. Now, I'm a massive geek, so I was saying things like, yes, this, this tax cut, this sort of legislation will cause this tax cut, here's why it's a bad, bad thing to do. And I think that's the only reason the Commonweal's response to this consultation was included in the final report. Because there was a, a response from uh, the STUC and a response from Unite that was excluded from the final report. And I've seen, I haven't seen the Unite response, but I have seen the STUC response, and they were just answering the question with, we think these tax cuts are a bad idea, we think these workers' rights cuts are a bad idea. They weren't strictly asking the question asked, so they were excluded for you know, not answering the question. Interestingly, the consortium behind the fourth free port also put in a submission that was included and mentioned in the final report. However, their response was excluded from the database of, of submissions. We can't read it. I suspect they didn't give us permission to read it. I should probably FOI that. The other major tax cut that's, that's proposed is on local authority business rates. Nothing is really known about this at the moment. I hope maybe Greg can give us a bit more insight into this. The last I checked was there was a reference in, in uh, March from the Scottish Government saying that they were going to run a consultation on whether or not local authorities should be allowed to offer business rates cuts to free ports. But I have not seen that consultation, nor yet any mention of it since March. So I'll let folks know when I do, unless we get some more from that. Um, where's Commonwealth's view on this? Ultimately, we need to be thinking about our trade powers not just as a, a means of giving companies tax cuts. We need to be starting to look at them as a, as a, as a force for, for, for good and soft power in the world. We have a, a, a plan within our, our Green New Deal plan that involves do, giving beneficial trade deals to, company, to countries that are at least keeping up with Scotland on our Green New Deal progression. Um, and that involves things like externality taxes that, that account for the pollution that goods create wherever they are created and then wherever they're imported. Interestingly, the European Union this month is launching the world's first carbon border tax. So if you are producing goods that use a lot of electricity and that, that electricity is produced entirely by renewable energy, then you will not have to pay the tax for the carbon emitted from that energy. However, if you're trying to produce the goods using coal power plants, then you will have to pay the tax to sell into the EU. This was a policy that we suggested in 2019 in our, in our Green New Deal. We thought, we're not going to get away with this one. This is far too radical. No one's going no to uh, not push back on this. Not only did people not push back, the EU is doing it. And when the idea was given to the Scottish Climate Assembly in 2021, they demanded the plan with a, with a, um, with a vote of 95%. Come on, people. You, you get 100 people in a room in Scotland and ask them, are puppies cute, and you won't get a 95% approval rate. Um, so, thanks for that. That's a fairly overview, uh, brief overview of everything that's going on with the free folks as I know it. Um, we have a common meal a plan for what an independent Scotland could look like, a 10-year development plan, and it does involve things like responsible trade and manufacturing and, and economic development. It's called Sorted, a handbook for a better Scotland. I have a few copies with me if you want to, want to buy one at the end. Um, other than that, just to say Commonweal is entirely dependent on our, on our donors and supporters to, to keep us going, so 
if you do want to, to support our policies, our campaigns, and you know, allow me to come to events like this and tell you what's going on, then please go onto our website, sign up as a donor. We don't get the bit of the government money, we don't get the, the, the donations from the, the free boat consortiums. We don't even have that on our website, so please keep us going. So I'll leave that that. I'll pass over to, to, Pat, to Graham, and I'm looking forward to your questions a bit later. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for that, Craig. That was very, very good, very interesting. Um, I don't profess to have any technical knowledge about free ports or, or whatever, but what I was proposing to do today was maybe just go through what we did in Inverness, because that was our, our, our first meeting about free ports, and we um, didn't exactly know what we were doing about it. But we had a meeting on the 26th of August, uh, very well attended, a lot of business people came along to it and asked some very pertinent questions. Um, so we've taken these questions away and are looking at them in more depth and hopefully we'll get some sort of reply to them. But I was just looking at my notes of the, the meeting and I think we had a sort of debrief after the meeting which was regarded as being very successful. The main outcome was that the consensus of opinion was that Virtually nobody, even within the business community of Inverness and Islands, knew anything or very little about a free boat right on their doorstep. I mean, it's ridiculous. Crazy stuff. Absolutely zero consultation. In fact, I had quite careful conversations, in, informal conversa conversations with some of the, the business community, and they were absolutely appalled by what was proposed. Again, right on their doorstep without any uh, involvement. So, um, we've learned a lot from that first meeting. This is the second such meeting, and hopefully we'll have another three meetings. And as we progress the meetings, hopefully our knowledge um, will, will expand, because it is as transparent as mud to what has been going on. That is the problem. The politicians are hiding behind their um, political thing. I mean, Kate Forbes, for example, we tried to get her to come along to the meeting in Inverness. She declined and said that she was otherwise engaged. Again, we invited all the politicians from this area, everybody in the constituencies around here, MPs, MSPs, local councillors. Where are they? Why aren't they here? So, anyway, this is just to give you a little whiff, if you like, of what's on the agenda. This is a direct uh, extract from Highland Council um, document which is published in, on their website. By the way, so deep on their website that you can hardly find it. Anyway, we found it. And it was a lengthy document. And tucked away right at the very end of the document was this little beauty. An appendix showing a package of incentives. Right, as Craig's already said, uh, up at the top of the, the appendix, they go on to say tax sites. Now, you've got to realise there's a difference between a tax site and a custom site uh, in terms of how the tax situation is treated. I don't want to go into the techn technical details just now because it gets a wee bit complicated. However, right, these are, these are what are proposed for the Inverness and Cromarty sites. Right. Land transactions within tax sites benefit land and building transactions tax relief. Uh, next bullet point, 10% rate of structures and buildings allowance on construction or renovation every year for 10 years. 100% enhanced capital allowances for the first year investing in new plant machinery. Employers pay zero national insurance contributions on salaries up to 25,000 for new employ employees in the first three years. 100% non-domestic rate relief for five years, which means for five years the Highland Council are shooting themselves in the foot and not getting any business rates out of the sites. Crazy. Right, the custom sites, again, they're more like, I mean, for example, uh, the port at Niggin Cromart is one of the deep water ports in the east of Scotland, in fact, it's one of the deepest uh, deep water ports in Scotland. So, 
they have a considerable interest in the customs uh, sites because their principal role is going to be creating and uh, building the wind turbines, importing the parts, assembling on the yard, and then re-exporting to wherever. So, import duties suspended, duty inversion for goods entering customs zones, which means if you've already paid duties on the, on, on the goods coming into the zone, the duties are inverted and you get the money back. It's repaid uh, because it's not subject to uh, tax coming into the port. Right, customs duty exemption on import goods processed in the green free port and re-exported re uh, subject to free trade agreements. Import VAT on goods entering the free port is completely suspended. Simplified, whatever that means, import and export procedures. Okay, so, um, right, this is the one that really gets me. Innovation. New sandboxes. Presumably you know what a sandbox is. It's a method by which businesses can develop um, usually innovative uh, things and, and they develop things through the, through the sandbox. But they go on to say that the sandboxes will, give, will relax specific regulations to test innovative propositions, whatever the hell that means. It sounds like they're good for a fee for all and just relaxing the whole thing. So you can do what you like as long as you're within that free port zone. Now, I'll go on to explain this in a bit more depth. Um, a green free port collaboration hub gives a platform to create regional innovation hubs. Now, it's a pity you didn't have slides here, I could have shown you so you could see it for yourself, but within Inverness, you've got two separate free port areas. You've got Inverness Harbour itself part of the, the industrial estate in Inverness. The Inverness and Highlands camp, in, um, University campus in its entirety for research and development. Out at Cromarty and Nick, you've got the whole area in Nick up to Invergordon and including Invergordon um, industrial estate, all part of the Freeport. So that, that at the moment has been delineated by the Highland Council and whoever is um, behind the the board of the Freeport at Cromarty. The, just as Craig was saying, this is where it kind of differs. Within the already delineated area, which is some of it's already been fenced off by the way, for example Inverness Harbour, um, and shut to the public. So beyond that, the area which is described as the red zone um, is 75 kilometres wide and extends up to Brora in the north, out to Bewey in the west, out to Nairn in the east, and beyond Inverness, including Inverness City, to beyond south of Inverness. So within that area, this is going back to the Greenport, Green Freeport Collaboration Hub. If you want to build your business outside the particular area that the Freeport's in, you can do so within that red zone. You might want to clarify that kind of up. I'm getting the right end of this thing here. Yeah, good. So, um, there you have it, black and white subject to no reduction, straight out of horse's mouth from Highland Council. So, there you go. Then, as I said, with the tax head on, they're serious. I mean, we're talking about 25 years, these three boards are not allocated, without any say so from the locals, without any input from locals. Uh, there's been zero democratic input. In fact, we had we received um, notification that Highland Council were supposedly having a meeting about free ports on the 3rd of October. That hasn't materialised. It's not it's certainly not open to the public. Um, so, I mean, the whole thing seems to be driven by um, Westminster and Michael Gove in particular with the levelling up stuff that's coming out of there. Um, and to all intents and purposes, I'm coming at this from a salvo point of view, by the way, our territory in Scotland is sovereign to the Scots people. It's not theirs to give away. So, that's where we're coming from with salvo hosting these meetings. So, the question is, as I said earlier, where are our elected representatives? What have they got to say about this? At the Inverness meeting, we had quite a, a detailed uh, discussion about this. 
and without exception, everybody agreed, we need to take it to them. You need to start writing to them, knocking on their doors, <coughs> being a general nuisance, and asking seriously pertinent questions. Who gives you the authority to do this? It's not, your, it's not yours to do. It's up to us, the people, to decide what we do with our own land. So, as Craig said, this is all part of the Brexit agenda, which we in Scotland didn't even vote for, but it's been foisted on us anyway, against our settled will. So, where do we go next? Any ideas? We can talk about that later. We can all very well speaking about it here, but what are we going to do about it? There's not much at the moment that we can do, other than getting making serious problems for our elected reps. Um, but I think we've got some ideas up our sleeve um, as we plan out with the meetings, and we might take things a stage further, um, which we can't comment on at the moment. So, thank you very much for listening, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Pat Lee. Um, a unison member. I'm not sanctioned by any union to come and speak to you. I'm speaking on behalf of the union movement um, as being a member. So, ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you to shed light on a concerning issue that has potential. Now, what we're going to see here is we're, we're, we're sort of repeating ourselves, but. I've written the speech, so I'm just going to do it for you. Uh, concerning issues that has the potential to undermine the half-port rights and protections of workers in Scotland, it is the creation of three ports area and the negative impact they pose on employment rights. Three ports, touted as catalysts for economic growth, are designated zones within a country where goods can be imported, manufactured, and re-exported with reduced taxes, regulations, and customs control. While they may appear attractive on the surface, we must critically examine the consequences they bring, particularly to the rights and well-being of workers. One of the most significant concerns regarding free ports is the potential erosion of employment rights, and we could see that with uh, an, an example Pino, Pino Ferries, Enios, they are all within these free ports. Uh, so there are areas often come with relaxed labour laws and reduced workers' protections, which can lead to exploitative working conditions. And you only need to look up the road at uh, Amazon to have a, a wee look at that. In pursuit of attracting investment, and boosting trade, companies operating within the free ports will prioritise profit over the welfare of their employees by offering tax incentives that have been described just two minutes ago, uh, deregulation. Free ports and our government will create a race to the bottom where businesses seek to cut costs by minimising wages, circumventing safety regulations and limiting workers' rights to organise. And our own bloody government is doing that itself. This undermines the progress made in ensuring fair wages, safe working environments and collective bargaining. More importantly, the establishment of free ports will disrupt the existing industries and local businesses. As companies flock to these zones to take advantage of the economic benefits Traditional industries will suffer, leading to job losses and a decline in employment opportunities for the local communities. You only have to look at the state of community high streets with the introduction of out-of-town retail parks. They are now deserted and unoccupied, and that is without the intent of, of lower taxes and less non and less to non-existent. Uh, regulations. This not only jeopardises workers' livelihoods, but also widens the wealth gap and exacerbates social inequality. Moreover, free ports will facilitate tax evasion and illicit activities, 
The reduced oversight and customs controls create an environment susceptible to smuggling, money laundering, and other illegal practices. These activities not only undermine the rule of law, but divert resources that could be allocated to essential public services and infrastructure, further impeding the overall well-being of the population. In conclusion, while free ports may promise economic growth and increased trade, we must not overlook their potential negative impacts on employment rights. Dilution of labour protections and the exploitations of workers and the erosion of established rights are serious concerns that demand our attention. We must strike a balance between econ economic development and the preservation of workers' rights, ensure that progress does not come at the expense of human dignity and social justice. The introduction of free ports will be the straw that breaks the camel's back. They will benefit no one but the grifting shysters and bastard billionaires. And they know how to extract, extract as much profit from as little investment as possible. And we, the worker, will pay that price once again. We demand that the government cease and desist from impl the implementation of free ports and we instruct, we instruct the government, representatives of every party and none, and today I'm taking the opportunity to call on the STUC and the TUC to mobilise and stop free ports in their tracks because they are coming after our ancestors' hard fought rights, our wages, and standard of living. Let's take the fight to them. Now it's your turn. Who wants to speak first? Just a quick show of hands in the room. Um, who's heard of Article 19 of the Act, the Act of the, the Treaty of Union? Anyone heard of Article 19? Just a couple. Right. That article states that Scots law is upheld as it was prior to the Union in perpetuity. Everyone knows what perpetuity means, yeah? Perpetual motion and all that just never ends, right? So, we've got a law that our namesake is attached to salvo, jury, something, you're going to have to help me out with a other big long Latin name at the end of it, it's uh, <laughs> quite unpronounceable, but it says something. That gives us the, the, um, the right to call out any legislation that then interferes with another right that we have, and that's the one that's, that's the most important one, as far as I'm concerned, in the claim of right. And that's the one that says, um, it says your freedoms, liberties, and um, you know, privileges are inalienable. And that means they can't be voted of existence, they can't be taken away. It's a bit like it's a bit like your factor, your factor that, that deals with your grounds of your you have to pay those, right? In your in your property documents, it says that you know the, the committee can't vote that themselves out of existence. So nobody has, to, nobody has to pay it. That's that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. We cannot vote that out of existence. So can we use Article 19 to actually get a hold of the people together, which is one of the communities of our realm, because we're a community of our own realm. So the people that run our community, we can go to them and say, would you agree with us that this is detrimental to our you know, rights, freedoms, and all the rest of it, yeah? Once we get a big enough hold of people together, we can take that to our politicians, whether it's the, poli the politicians down in Westminster or the, or the politicians in the branch office up here. So, um, any thoughts on that, panel? Uh, I think wholeheartedly, um, but we have to we have to mobilise the people, and we have to mobilise our trade unions, and we have to mobilise our, 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 our representatives in government, council. We have to we have to have them doing their jobs. This is, going to, this is absolutely going to be detrimental, not only to employee, employee um, rights, employee rights, but the environment is at risk here. 
because if there's if there's a there's a company called Enios that holds the licenses for fracking right now. There's a moratorium, and with the deregulation within three ports, what's they stop them circumventing the government's moratorium? And if they have the ability to set up outside the zone, then we're talking about going to Glasgow as well. The whole country is open to exploitation for the wealthy, and it will impact on the worker. It will impact on our communities. So we need to mobilise and we need to get the, those representatives up off the asses and acting on our behalf. Just one sort of expansion on that. Um, actually the fracking thing isn't so much of an issue with these free ports as they are because the free ports themselves don't impact planning permission and the Scottish Government still has power over planning permission for fracking which they won't give. So that's not so much of an issue uh, as things stand. And that's, that's kind of brings into a, a bit more of a response to, to you, sir, that the Scottish Government isn't a passive observer in this. It's not, these aren't things that are just being landed on Scotland from out with. The Scottish Government is a partner in these and is doing, uh, and is, is, is part of this. Um, if, if you search out the, the report for the Land and Building Transaction Tax Consultation, You'll see in it where Commonweal's um, response to that consultation was perhaps the Scottish Government should consider increasing devolved taxes within free ports to partially compensate for the tax cuts that the UK Government was giving. So if the, tax, if the UK Government was offering a company a million pounds in tax cuts, maybe the Scottish Government wants to increase their taxes by half a million pounds, <laughs> for example. They'll give them somewhat of a tax cut, but then the Scottish Government gets some revenue. The Scottish Government directly responded to, to, to my point on that, simply saying, no, we're not going to do that. So, yeah, the Scottish Government itself does have significant powers of control within these free ports. They just need the will to use them in the way that we want them to. And that's where the political movement comes in as well. Um, Pat, you basically answered some of my questions. I was going to ask about Ineos. Um, but Graham, we sent invitations to uh, lots of media. Um, I was just wondering, since we don't have any uh, political representation here, did we hear anything from any of the press that we contacted? Because again, like in Inverness, there was nobody there either, and we really need the, the media to be involved in this as well to give us support. Yeah, I'll, I'll reply to that, Mr. Uh, no, we didn't get any response from any of the media, despite blitzing them with invites. So, um, I would agree with that gentleman there. Um, we need to form uh, groupings. I mean, this is what this is why Salvo are promoting these events. Because obviously Salvo is based on the premise of the clean right and all the rest of it goes with it. So I think we're quite correct. Sorry. I'm being told off here about my mic. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think we need. I mean, we're, we're, it's early days. Yeah, I mean, this is only the second meeting, so I think the primary thing that we've got to do now is make people aware. And as soon as people find out the, the truth of what's actually happening, I think you'll find that people will, will actually become rather inflamed and want to do something about it. But Pat's absolutely right. We need to get it out to the unions and things like that and get everybody that we can engaged in it. Because politically it's going nowhere with the Scottish Government, so it's over to us, the people, to do something about it. We are sovereign. Bill, Bill here. Bill, do you want to ask that? Last week, uh, Salvo presented the Stirling Directive to the Scottish Parliament. Under that directive, uh, related to the claim of right, we directed the Scottish Government 
to follow the, the Scottish people's wishes. Would Pat like to expand on that? Under Scots con constitutional law, we have the right to, to direct our government and they must act on it. And the simple fact is we have been deferring this to the Scottish Government, to Westminster. We are not using the laws that are in place at this time. We need to inform, educate the, the population of the rights that we hold right here now. The Stirling Directive was not accepted by the, 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 the Scottish Government. It was accepted by an undergraduate who was sent out to a car park to receive this. The fact is that we, the Scots people, hold the power. We are not, at this point, asserting and declaring that power. So when the campaign has begun to assert and declare and use the laws that we have in place, our inalienable right to instruct and expect the government to act on our behalf for our common good. This whole idea in Freeports goes against that principle in its entirety. It is not going to be of any benefit to the Scottish people and the Scottish nation, so it shouldn't be happening. And if we assert our right and assert our power, we can stop this from happening. The behaviour of the Scottish Government is has formed a pattern, hasn't it? Every every subject, every um, contentious subject, shall we say, is treated in the same way. They have a so-called consultation, and each one of them, as we've heard today with this one, is flawed, deeply flawed. Um, the, the, there are, the, there are move, moves from other parties to do something about this to try and unseat the Scottish Government, but that's going to take years. And um, I must say, the ISP uh, have, 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 uh, are in, in, ch in, ch uh, chime in full tune with, with, with uh, Salvo. Uh, they're the, as far as I know, the only party that, that is in full you know, agreement with Salvo. Uh, and um, consequently, we, you know, we're form, we forming a partnership in a way. But but it has to be said that um, it's going to take quite a long time for that to happen. Probably more longer than we've got. What will be left of the country by the time another party takes over from the SNP? The SNP have got us over a barrel in uh, with the GRA, with all these other other uh, issues that we've been talking about. Um, th they say, if you want independence, you've got to keep voting for us. And, uh, but that means you've got to take everything else that goes with it. Uh, so that, that, that is a despicable position that they're in. So, so, so what you said, Pat, about chimes in with what other people are saying now, that we need to take to the streets. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm sure that every Salvo member uh, will, will if, you, if, you, if you say, uh, um, have a, a, a trade union um, uh, demonstrations in various places. I'm sure every Salvo member will join you, and uh, you know you, we will put the word out and we will back it completely. You know because I think we need we need another approach. You know, an, an, a, a non-political one. Uh, and, and, and finally, I just say there is a there is a precedence for this. In, in the 1980s, uh, there was. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, in the 1980s, I just want to mention this precedence, you know, it's not like we've invented something that's been done for the first time. Um, there was a group called the Scotland UN Committee, uh, which was formed, which, which uh, started off with having no standing whatsoever, ended up a very influential player in the, in the formation of, the, you know, the, the new Scottish Parliament. So it's been done before, and, and uh, why can, do you know why it can't be done again? Does anybody can tell me why it won't work this time? 
uh, you know, uh, consider what they say, but in my opinion, that's the way forward. Uh, and, and obviously, politicians have got to come into it at some point, uh, otherwise, people will be saying we're, we're, we're doing UDI by the back door, you know, but we don't want that. So, but, but um, I mean, that, I'm not actually, you know, I'm really making a statement rather than a question, but I've just some things that I've picked up from what you guys have been saying. The, the, the idea of the common good is being t t totally ignored. And, but the common good is, is something that Salvo uh, got running through the blood, you know. So thanks, for, thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. I'd actually like to ask, is that better? Okay. Um, we've advertised this on Twitter, Facebook. We need to get more people along. We and do the panel have any ideas how to encourage more people along to these public meetings? To be honest, this is something that Common Wheels kind of kind of been studied for a while, and we're not as good at it as as we'd like to be. I could really admit that, but. To be honest, meetings like this have hit their limit. Right. The, 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 if you look around the world at the examples of you know, pop, popular progressive movements, they happen at the level of the peer-to-peer. -peer. They don't happen with bringing people into a hall to be lectured at, right. uh, especially with, with just respect to colleagues, three white men. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what you should be doing, talk to your friends, talk to your family. Right. Get them talking to their friends and their family. That's what works. Hi, uh, does, is the sound okay for that? A bit louder, okay. Um, I've got two questions. First, uh, but well, first I just wanted to say that um, I did email my local councillor um, this morning, so it was very late. Um, she said she would have been interested in coming, but obviously it's too late, she was not able to do it. Um, so, and she does. She sent me a link to what sounds like an interesting uh, Scottish uh, Finance Committee meeting a while back, which I'll, I'll look up later and uh, put into um, the Sterling Salvo um, system. Um, the first question I've got, I've had a quick skim through uh, some of the stuff on, the, on both the UK government and the Scottish government websites about free ports. Uh, first question is about um, a lot of statements about, uh, was it Fair Work First? Practices, um, and I'm, my, my question about that is: How does that relate to? How do any commitments to that, which is a pretty limited um, umbrella, relate to actual UK or Scotland or even EU in employment law, and which has precedence? How much does employment law apply to the free port, uh, you know, established employment law? And the second thing is: um, What are the time limits? for some of these tax and other concessions, because it, from my, my reading so far, some of them do expire after a, a number of years, and there is a, supposedly a review process in there for it. But um, I'm wondering how much you think that might open up an opportunity for a future Scottish Government to challenge and change the course of these three ports. Thank you. Um, yeah, but, but, but as regards the question of tax, there are yeah uh, proposed sorry, there are uh, proposed limits. I mean, for example, uh, domestic rate relief is eligible for businesses for five years. Um, likewise, the um, structures and buildings allowance is available every year for ten years, so it's not going on perpetually. There are time limits in place. Um, quite how the actual tax thing is going to work, for example, employers, national dunes, we don't know at this stage because that, that seems to be set in sand. Uh, so there's a few things we need to uh, follow up and find out further detail about it because if you gloss over their official sites, there's not much in there that actually tells you anything much. So we've got to do a bit more deeper thing. Yeah, so the, the Scottish Government Fair Work Principles it essentially is a little addition to like procurement uh, processes where if the Scottish Government wants to employ a company to, 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 for services or goods, then it can, when it's put it out to tender, you know, if Company A has signed up to the Fair Work Principles and Company B hasn't, then Company A gets more points, might win the tender. But 
they are kind of optional, as, as the Scottish government itself says, that companies applying for free port status may give commitments on union, uh, union recognition and real living wage. But they don't have to. They can meet the UK minimums instead, which is to not do that. Um, a bigger problem for me with these free ports isn't so much the legislation on paper, though it's regulation and enforcement. If, if, if these things are happening behind a, behind a, a reservoir fence and, and regulators don't have access to them, and, um, and even, either because the gate's locked or there's just their free ports, we just let them do what they like, then those laws are not getting enforced even when they are. We see this with things like the penal ferries, we see this with, you know, with the offshore industry as well, where workers' rights are, are regularly eroded and wage competition is uh, um, regularly eroded because, um, because there's just no regulation of the laws that are in place. And I, I'd really hate to see that encroaching into these, these free ports as well. That's, that's very much my Can I just say, in the innovation, new regulatory sandboxes. Am I, am I right in saying that that's, that they will experiment on pushing those regulations as far as they possibly can? And you can, you can rest assured, it will not be for the benefit of the worker. It will not be for the benefit of the worker. The worker will pay the price and the standards and the, and the welfare and, and the regulation and trade union law and as for, as for um, the, the, the response from uh, Kate Forbes that she is, um, she is pleased that by making re regeneration and creating high quality jobs the lead objective, objective um, £25,000 is there a highly paid job? Is there a highly technical job? £25,000 is, is close to the minimum wage. So, all these words and rhetoric, you can rest assured that when big bosses want to make their profit, it won't be high, highly paid jobs. It might be highly skilled jobs, but it's a damn race to the ball. Hi. <laughs> I was just oh, I was just wondering whether um, you know Scottish business groups could be somebody could you know try and sort of go along as a representative to try and discuss this with them. I mean, God, I mean there was a business group down there where Prince Charles attended, and you know what I mean. I, I just feel that um, we ought to not just Scottish businesses, and, but just inform people, as many people as we can, if that means getting out onto the streets and shopping centres and, you know, even, you know, just get them a car and, and, uh, and somebody with a, you know, going around the streets and informing people because I didn't know anything about, I wasn't even a, a salon member uh, until just a few months ago, so my knowledge was pretty limited, really. And I think it just takes, just informing, like Craig said, as many people as, as you possibly can, because I'm in Facebook and into my inbox and my Facebook account comes many, you know, projects and, and awareness of things that's, and, that's going on in the world and to sign up. But really, we're kind of over we're over overwhelmed by all these. You need to get out to actually talk to people and let them know about our rights. Yeah. That's how I see it anyway. Yeah, I, I, that's very pertinent because the, the situation will be that a business inside the zone gets all these packages of incentives, but a business just outside the zone yeah. pays its way. It's like it's like the tax incentives for the mega rich. They pay 20% on their, their earnings. You and I pay up to 40%. You know, it's, it, it's not rocket science. The business community really need to engage with us because it's going to affect them worse. Just as we, we had out, uh, out of town retail parks and our high streets died, that they can expect the same 
uh, same result, shall we say, should these come into practice? Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I think you're quite right. I mean, we need to get out and speak to people. I, like you, even though I was a member of Salvo, knew nothing much about free ports until suddenly caught on the fact that lo and behold there was a free port coming into effect in Inverness and a new green fence went up around it. So, apart from saying literally you've got one side of the fence where businesses can operate um, virtually tax free, the other side of the fence you've got the industrial estate across the other side of the road which is effectively operating under normal conditions, paying their business rates and all the rest of it. So, it's ludicrous. Um, so, how, uh, that was the question I asked when I said, how, where, where are we going next with this? And I think the, the public need to know, and I think one of the best ways of getting the message out there is A, through the unions, and B, through establishing good working links with business communities within the area. Now, as I said, to begin with, I, I dipped my toe in the water with some of the local businesses in Inverness. And, uh, I won't elaborate too much, but I think we're building some fairly decent bridges with some of the, the business communities there. And basically, they, they are coming on site. So they can advise their own employees, their, their um, members within, within the business associations. And on another flip side of the coin, the trade unions should be doing some serious heavy duty work with their union members. Um, so yeah, there's ways and means to get out there, but either way, we need, to, we need to let people know what's going on. Because there is such an ignorance uh, among people who just read the papers, watch the telly. There's been nothing coming out in any comment um, as to what's happening under their very noses. The people of Edinburgh, virtually the entire city, is going to be part of the Freeport. So I'll pass you over to Craig to say. Yeah, just, just to add that, um I mean, it's not for lack of trying on the, the part of a lot of the unions, the group, um, especially the STGC, who, who have come out quite strongly uh, against these free ports and are campaigning on it. It just doesn't help when their submissions to consultations get rejected because they, they didn't answer the question the way the Scottish Government wanted to answer, to answer the question. Um, so, so yeah, we are seeing a lot of teeth coming from the trade union movement. So, if you're a member of the, if you're a member of the trade unions. Um, you know, keep engaged and keep that pressure on because uh, the, the, there is a potential for some movement there. Sorry, before we go, we go on for more questions, I've just been given a list to the current partners for the fourth report, which is he asked the road to kindly read out to let, to let you know who, who's really behind this. Right, bear with me, uh, I've got a fairly bad hand, so. I might not be able to get the paper properly, but anyway, Arl Gip Innovation Campus, Babcock, Bryden, The Ropes Group, Calachem, Catapult, um, cheers, thanks, Pat. City Regional Deal, Edinburgh and South East Scotland, Edinburgh Airport, Edinburgh, the City of Edinburgh Council, Edinburgh College, the University of Edinburgh, ENBU, Partners in the UK, Offshore Wind, which is part of the BP Group, Falkirk Council, Fife Chambers of Commerce, Fife College, Fife Council, Fourth Ports, Fourth Valley Chamber of Commerce, Fourth Valley College, and um, that's it, Henry Watt University, uh, Invest Fife, N oh, Enios, I could have forget that one. NMIS, National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, Oceanera, Primal Pharma Solutions, why does that not surprise me, uh, Queen's Ferry One, Scarborough Muir Group, and the Scotland actually, 5G Centre, and the University of Strathclyde. Yeah. So there you have it. These are those. No, no. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that if a company, if a company deems it necessary to operate or, or start their business outside of the zone 
they have the right to do so, am I right? Yes, although they have to have a presence in the zone to get the tax cuts, and that, that's, that was another aspect of the, the LBTT consultation that I found um, very interesting. That where an office was mi uh, uh, where an office or a warehouse was mixed use, so one side of the office is dealing with Freeport administration, the other side of the office is dealing with not in Freeport administration within the same company, then the company, the company can apply for 50% cuts to the tax. Uh, to to their the taxes. We argued against that, saying no, you have to have your free ports completely insulated from the domestic economy. Uh, that includes the car park for purposes of statutory. You have to you, you, you do have to keep the free port stuff separate from the non free port stuff. Again the Scottish Government said no. Um. The reason why you need to know the partners in there is because now you know all councils are involved in the free ports. Every council that's involved in the free ports has a member on the board. And the members on the board will invite to come to this meeting. And they can come in. That's all. Yeah, uh, bri briefly, before I move on to free ports, um, the lack of elected representatives here. And the way that um, and every uh, number of us here were treated at Hollywood uh, on uh, Tuesday and Colette, myself, at St Andrew's House. Uh, I was wondering whether, with every communication that we sent to elected representatives, should have something on it that says that they, they are in position uh, only by the will of the people of Scotland. Uh, the, the point I want to make in free ports is I'm no expert in free ports. It's not, it's not my field. Uh, human rights is my field. So I wonder if uh, the three gentlemen uh, on the platform can uh, send me their concerns uh, on free ports and I can uh, look at the human rights ramifications. We've also got the colleges and universities involved. Now, universities and colleges, students are in unions. The majority of local authority workers are also in unions. So can we not do something and hopefully mobilise these people to understand what's going on? Um, because I really feel that I, I can't get my head around how you can actually give away all this tax money from a country that is so dependent on the United Kingdom because we give such a small tax revenue to the United Kingdom. How can they possibly afford to give us all this money for these people free, which is not going to come into our country at all. Basically, it's going to just sit in these wee ports. What's going to happen to the infrastructure within the country if we have this money just leaking out for however many years? <coughs> Who's going to pay for that? 
are just not going to happen. There'll be less doctors, there'll be less schools, there'll be less of everything. The roads are in a terrible state now. What's going to happen? So if they're going to give all this money away, it just doesn't make sense. None of it adds up. None of it makes sense. They're all at it one way or another. And I really think we need to get more people mobilised behind it and plug into the people that we've already got in some of these places that are standing up. Well, we're partners here. Well, let's just undermine them and take, you know, go into the people. <laughs> I don't think you'll have any argument from MD in this group. We have to we have to engage with the public, we have to engage with the business community, and we have to we have to instruct our, our union to get involved here. And it's a it's a case of a campaign and it's if it if it means civil disobedience, then so be it. Because we, we get rid of the poll tax by civil disobedience, by being organized by being able to react at the, at the drop of a hat, and that's where we have to go with us. Hi, um, I just had a quick look at uh, the gross national income of Scotland versus the gross national product. In uh, 2021, there was 10.1 billion pounds going out of the Scottish economy. 10.1 billion pounds going out of the Scottish economy. Now, I don't really believe that figure, because if you know anything about jails, that's a nonsense. I believe that figure is much higher. It's, uh, they're saying it's something like 10%, it's probably more like 30, 40%. Now, if you bring these three ports in, it's going to get worse. Our people will get poorer. That's us, everybody. Nobody's going to benefit. All the money will go to tax havens. Craig? Yeah, you, you, I mentioned that paper of profit uh, that, that we're going to be publishing soon on profit extraction, and it's based in large part on those figures that you just quoted there, the, the, the 10.1 billion pounds that left Scotland in 2021. Um, we also have already published a paper uh, unrelated to free ports on, on things like the PFI schemes and, and similar schemes in Scotland that where a lot of that money leaks into tax havens. Scotland has a huge amount of money leaking out of Scotland, uh, often into tax havens or into shareholder profits. Um, can't tell you any more of the figures in the paper until it's published, but keep an eye out for it when it is. Hi there, it's Mike Hogger here. Um, yeah, very quickly, the, the extent of the free ports, I heard that the, the free port was probably going to extend out to Kokenzi, and the, because of the, the finance of the free port, it's now made the, um, the viability of a deep water port being dredged there viable. Any news on that particular thing? No. no. So that's news to you guys? <laughs> no, but. Uh, as we've seen about the Highland Freeport area, the, the, the red zone extends beyond the current delineated area, so it's quite possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I believe that was quite a good source. I got that from you, so I'm um, a follow up and then feed it through salvo communication one way or another. Yeah. Uh, uh, Craig came up with the map the other night there that showed the existing boundary and it had extended by, I don't know how much Craig have got to download it. Uh, I've got a, I've got I've got the map on my phone if you want to see it there come up to me after afterwards uh, and unfortunately it's couldn't get the slides working to show you that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to this area from here. Well I'm just gonna agree with what Pat said there, civil disobedience. Yeah. A wee example of that would have been when you went to give the stirring uh, to that directive to go up to the parliament. A flunky was sent out to take it. In my opinion, what should have happened was that somebody got a ticket for the gallery, stood up and said, you're not accepting this, throw over and say, it's now been delivered now, do something about it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
can I, can I say if just stop oil can get the publicity that they require to get their message out, then we have to do the same. Yeah. Hi. Have the Scottish Government actually cited any success stories that amongst people? Um, and I've not I've been through some of the thing the consultations, the land consultation, and then these things are a nightmare to, to work through. Um, but have they given an example of a success story? Very scarce. Very, very scarce because, um, as I say, I think this, where, they are, where there are genuine supporters of this idea, it does come from that textbook economics idea of you cut, you, you cut taxes, then growth happens and you get more revenue than you would have otherwise, which just doesn't happen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they do laugh our curve economics. Everyone picks on the on, on, on the left hand side of the laugh our curve. Um, so, so no, they, they don't cite the examples. Yes, um, this is really a question for Craig. Uh, although uh, the chap from the left, sorry, if I'm not your name. Uh, you said that the business community were totally ignorant of uh, free votes. Now, Craig, uh, you're very familiar with uh, Business for Scotland, McIntyre Kent. What's, what's their line on this? Because you would have thought this would have been right up their street. Uh, just from an organisational perspective, I wouldn't presume to put words in their mouth. I'm sorry, you know. Just ask Gordon, he'll be happy to tell you. Uh, but I can't, sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't speak as a half of them, sorry. Hello? Right. Now, first of all, the, the free port things of the Sovereign Scott really, really annoy me, right? Because it's a blatant land strip and asset strip. Now, you yeah, spoke yeah, about yeah. the Scottish government being in control. Well, in actual fact, no, they're not, because they're in partners with Westminster. Now, they've allowed Westminster into their land to rape it under their watch, which I find beyond the pale, to be perfectly honest. Now, you look at where the free ports start in the fourth estuary and where the free ports end and how wide they are. It's basically everything that's worth anything in this area. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can agree, disagree if you think frack is going to kick off. You're damn right it is, because you've got one gentleman who's the, in the company that owns the Greensmouth plant, he is on the board of Freeports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I lived in Dunfermline for 41 years of my life before I moved to North Lanarkshire. And Fife has riddled gold mines, as is Greensmouth, Falkirk, Edinburgh, oh, yeah. the Central Bell. Yeah. So it is, that's what's needed to get drummed out to people. You know, people have worked hard, they're, they're in a nice house, whatever the value of that house is, I'll guarantee will plummet if they've got a few behind them with a fracking rig in it. Now, this is what's needed to get pushed out, right? I get the understand a bit about the taxis, etc. But to me, a bricklayer for Addingston, that means absolutely nothing to me because it's going to not benefit me in a single, single penny. And it's not going to benefit anybody in this room or in anybody in the streets. Now, I agree that things have to be done, but I also agree that public meetings should be held as well, along with talking to people on the street. I was in Falkirk the March yesterday, and every single person I spoke to regarding free ports had no idea about it. Not a single person. <laughs> And then you start talking to them about it, you can actually physically see in their faces how angry they are. Yeah. Now, you talk about the Inverness, look at Inverness as well. Now, in a certain area, I might be right, I might be wrong here, but that takes into consideration our renewables. It also takes into consideration the hydrogen plant that's getting built, is it not, in that Freeport area up there? So, if you look at the two areas, right, you ask the question why is the two are east and one none in the west is because everything of worth is getting taken away from us. Mm -hmm. I read an article by a guy who I'm pro independence 100%, right? But what we are allowing with free ports is a similar argument what the UK government had with Brexit. Because if the free ports happen today and we become independent next week, then we've got to argue to get our own land back. 
Uh, I'll let you get back in me and get off my soapbox now because these things really, really annoy me. Completely agree when I was a wee bit down in public meetings, Emma. If anyone in here has walked out of here learning one thing, the meeting has been successful for you. Here's a wee challenge. Bring a friend to the next one. Bring a friend. Uh, yeah, also, Speak to your friends, get the information you take from these meetings to them as well. That peer-to-peer -peer interaction is far more convincing than anything I can tell them. What you tell them will convince them more readily than what I can tell them, so that is the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. And you're right, these free quotes will not benefit the, the majority of companies in Scotland who do not import and do not export. They will only benefit those chosen few who have that power. So, yeah, no. Thanks for that. Wealth grab, land, land grab, power grab. Yes. Hi. Um, so, I think the meeting has been very interesting. Hold and it's That's me. Hold, hold on a second. Oh, sorry. Hold your you, you beat me to it there. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to say, following on from the gentleman there, uh, he's absolutely hit the nail right in the head with what you're saying. We need, to, we need to get the real information out of there. Now, I, I sent a tweet out the other night, um, just a random tweet, which I do occasionally, asking a very simple question, what do you know about free boards? Um, and the, the response I got back was absolutely astounding. This guy who sent me a massive uh, thread back with very detailed, very enlightening information about the true extent of what's the, what the agenda is behind free boards, and for that matter, stuff like charter cities and all the rest of the nonsense that they're coming out with. It's all been driven by Westminster. Now, if you're on Twitter, look this guy up and have a look at this stuff with much interest. Um, he's spot on the nail. So he's called European Powell, and that's his Twitter handle is at European Powell. So look him up. I'll circulate this round and see what you think. I don't know if you got that, the, the handout that you got coming in, but it's very, very good stuff. And if the public knew with what's in there, what is in store for them, we're basically prisoners in their own country. Can I have a special note? Yes, sorry, John, that was just a quick interview because I thought that the gentleman's point was very good. Right, so uh, it's been really interesting, and I think uh, we have all gotten caught up to the same level of what free ports mean. I think also the conclusion here seems to be that there is some sort of civil disobedience needed on this and on other topics in Scotland. I think it's worth for the panel and also for everybody in the room to consider what has gone wrong in terms of civil disobedience in the last couple of years. Where has Scotland, where have the unions, where have the people failed to make their point part of that? Consideration is probably looking around in this room. Yes, we are all very white. Yes, we are older. Um, there is a real issue here and pretending like, oh, if we only can get the politicians in the room, it's not going to resolve the fact that the way that we're campaigning, the way that civil disobedience is not properly understood and not properly applied, and the way that it isn't inclusive, nor progressive and inventive in the way that we go about it, is a real issue. We can go and march on 17,000 issues over and over. It's going to have the same dampened and non-effective result. And that is despite the fact that civil disobedience and non-violent resistance is a, twice as likely to be a successful socially transformative tool than violence. We all know there is no better options than, than civil disobedience, but it needs to be done properly. And one of the things that I would like to close on is that you don't overcome the author authoritarianism that we have suffered in the last decade or so by looking for another leader. No. No. Lead yourselves, don't wait for somebody else to do it. Push the boundaries, be uncomfortable. <laughs> So say these free ports get implemented and there's nothing we can do for young people, what will it mean for them in, say, about 20 years?
Oh, 20 years time, you might, my hope is right before that time, the free courts have been abolished again. Yeah. Uh, because they are instruments of political will, and nothing is fixed in, fixed in stone forever. What, what can be, can be made, can, what can be made can be unmade. So that, that's the political challenge for us, is to, is to reverse this and, and start building a, a, a Scotland that does actually work for all of us, not just a few billionaires who want some, some more tax breaks. I would say I would say a few millionaires and billionaires these days. Um, I would hope in twenty years' time, three ports haven't even got out the ground, and that'll be because we've mo mobilised and we're taking the actions, and we're no bit passengers in our own lifetime. Yeah, I think was it, was it James at the back there? Yeah. Sorry, James. Yeah, unfortunately, the young young people need to take a, a, a grasp of this as well because it's going to affect your generations and future generations to come. Us oldsters sitting at the top table here uh, have other day basically. And I think the baton really needs to pass over to you guys uh, with your youth and uh, social media skills and stuff like that. So, uh, over to you then, James. Thank you very much. Um, it's just with regard to, you were going to have a presentation and I think it's really important to get that out onto social media and everybody's linked up on social media. It's not just a case of retweeting and reposting, it's maybe copying and, and pasting and reattaching the images, getting it out there and everybody working together as a team because there's that six degrees of separation. You can talk to your pals and your neighbours about this, but if you use social media correctly and you get the information out there on all social media, uh, working as a team, everybody knows the the um, people in the you know we all connected. Get it out there. You can get the presentation out there. The the piece of paper that you're referring to, uh, it's going to make it a lot of interest for people who don't know that much about it. Yeah. Uh, and just to reiterate, if you do search on YouTube for Craig DL and Free Ports, you'll find a version of the presentation I gave today uh, that's already up there with, with slides and some extra links. So I encourage you to watch that and spread it around. Why is that on uh, If you search for Craig DL and Free Ports on YouTube, you will find it. If you just search for Craig DL, you'll find a very talented DJ who is not me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, while well, we're on the subject of websites, um, if you've not already done so, navigate yourself to salvo.scot and there's a web uh, page all about free ports, which is, again, very, very interesting indeed. So, just more information for you. Sorry, thank you very much. Next question. Just addressing your point, Craig, about that you, you said at the start about capital flight, and that might, want, might be one of the fears of the Scottish Government. So for me, that's an opportunity for unions in Scotland to reach out to the unions in the rest of the UK and to really network on this, because all unions should be against this sort of neoliberal crap that they're coming out with now. Um, one other thing is, where does the Green come in in all this? What is the Green assurances? I noticed the Green Party are against it, in inverted commas, but it's not one of the red lines. They've got red lines on other policies, but not this. Well, I the unions in England will have a better idea of the negative impact in uh, free ports because they've got them. They've got them and they've not been a success. They are not being a success. They are draining the economy again. So the unions have to come on board. And I, as a, a union member, am instructing the unions to get on board. Come join us, show us how to organise, show us how to be out there and get the message across because they have the expertise. We have the expertise in, in probably grassroots movements, but we need to come together and make sure that the workers' rights are upheld at every aspect. And with this opportunity of creating sandboxes, whatever that bloody means, that gives them power to change whatever they wish. 
and it will be a race to the bottom. So we call on the union, I'm calling on the unions on behalf of Salvo to get, come on board with their expertise and let's get this done. And just to self-promote again, um, a lot of this is, is covered in our books. We sorted a handbook for a better Scotland that shows you how we can not just you know, start chasing and competing country to country or city to city for scraps of GDP growth, but to reform the economy into one that puts all of us first. So if you want to see more about how that all fits into the thing, come up to the end and I'll show you through the book. Just a very quick um, response to James and um, but history involved as well. You know, that two years, that clearances are cyclical. There was a clearance right after the Thatcher years. Many of my friends live in Australia and America and all over the place now because of Thatcher pulling the rug out from under their feet. If we let these free ports happen, James, your friends are gone. They're going to leave. It's another cleanness coming. That's the bottom line of this for the next generation. And get that message to them and tell them that and they might get on board. Just another wee quick one here, but what we can actually do, um, uh, basically, uh, we were on the wee talk last night and, and the organizers did. It's like, there are almost 7,000 members of Salvo. There are 126 MSPs. Each member of Salvo has five MSPs. They've got your local one and you've got four regional ones. At the end of the day, they all have surgeries. Right, okay, right. Okay, I go right the first time then, but uh, <laughs> that's my foot last night, I thought we missed it. Uh, anyway, the bottom line is, we've all got access to all these different MSPs, they all have surgeries. What we should be doing is organising one Friday, when they do, oh, most of the part of Highlands and Islands, some of them have them on Saturdays up there, but, but see, on a Friday afternoon, we should get more branded, go around and block their bloody yeah. surgeries and don't let them get home until they've built this. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, I'm not. Bear in mind that if you write to your yeah. MSP as a constituent, they have an obligation to respond to you. So, again, that kind of letter writing campaign, visiting the footwear surgeries, that, that's all powerful politics. Yeah. I'm talking about turning up and making sure yeah. they can't go home until they've listened to 14 folks standing in the queue. Don't even need to go to that level of protest <laughs> yet. Yet. But um, yeah, just turning up at their constituency surgeries. Everyone on the same day asking the same question across the country. That's a powerful campaign. Yeah. Can I just bring a wee bit of order back? Um, we're almost finished, are we? Um, that's, a, that's a great idea, Dave. But we need other ideas. So if anybody out in the meeting today has an idea, please send it to the, the, the core team or and the core team could possibly disseminate it be, between the hubs. This is the starting point, as it were, to put action in place. So there's, it's a great idea. I just want to talk in Teesside that had a lot of pollution eh, with dredging and environmental issues. And my worry, I come from up north, but I actually stay in Bogart, is the damage, the potential damage to the seas round about and the, and the dredging, these kind of ports and everything. Who's, you know, who's overseen that? Can I pick up another one? In, in the, the Highlands, a 
other part beyond uh, the Freeport idea, Nick Port was uh, subject to proposals to have oil transfer at sea. Now, we fought a, a considerably good campaign to stop that, and we stopped it in its tracks. So people that power does work. But you're right, within the Freeport areas, we're looking at devastation of the environment again, because there are no regulations. So, pollution, yeah, it's going to happen. Have we got any other questions or, or, or One last question yeah. here at the back. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for putting it with me again. Um, I'll try and make it quick. This is a question. I want to ask Pat if there's any danger of um, the, the uh, unions in England, for example, that they're, they're a lot most of them are pro you pro um, union, pro unions, you know, pro UK. Uh, for understandable reasons, is, is there any danger that, that there will be a conflict of interest with the uh, asking the unions to get in, in south of the border to get involved with us on this issue uh, against the fact that uh, you know, they don't want to encourage independence? You know? Thank you. Well, I, I personally don't know if, uh, if they will react in that way. I don't think they should be. Because this is not about independence, this is about workers and workers' rights. What we've gained so far over the, the century that there's been uh, organised unions, we, that's, that's at risk here. So, as a paying member of a union, I expect them to do everything in their power to protect my rights and my, my, my ancestors have for hard won rights. These have been diluted on a daily basis right now by a government, never mind multinational companies. Our government is diluting them. And we should be mobilising to stop that. So on that basis, I expect the unions to come on board. That's all we've got time for today. Can I ask you first to show your appreciation for in July? Yeah. <laughs> and thanks very much to Craig, Pat and Graham. They did a brilliant job. <laughs> and thank all of you. Brilliant questions and thanks for coming along. Before you go, I'm looking at you, before you go, our next meeting is in Dunfermline and it'll be on Friday the 27th of October. Um, we'll post the, the details near the time when we get Dave organised to get it up for us. <laughs> That's all for me. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.